Hello and welcome to World Inside on CGTN, coming to you from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. Coming up on today's program, how can the Chinese introduce the Belt and Road Initiative to help the United Nations to develop Afghanistan? And I interviewed the Chinese author Hao Jingfang, who won the prestigious Hugo Award for sci-fi works. We started this show with the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI. President Xi Jinping of China first introduced the Belt and Road Initiative in the fall of 2013, with an aim to improve trade and infrastructure connecting Asia with Europe and Africa. In the three years since the seeds were planted, the initiative is already bearing fruit. China is enlarging the vision of the Belt and Road Initiative, inviting partners from around the world to participate and benefit from the plan. China and Kazakhstan have implemented 51 projects on production capacity cooperation, worth around 26 billion U.S. dollars. One Belt, One Road is exactly way out for a lot of countries how to trade uh, and how to boost the economy. So a lot of countries hope that it could be a real road for their trade, for their goods, for financial flows, for the minds, for the thoughts that will go both way from China and to China. Apart from nation states, the Belt and Road Initiative has also given opportunities to international organizations to better mobilize their resources and promote development, especially in war-torn countries such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria and some African countries. Among all the organizations, the United Nations Development Program has abundant experience in addressing issues including poverty, education and development. Experts believe cooperation between the UNDP and the Belt and Road Initiative can better integrate resources including infrastructure, capital, knowledge and experience to further promote development in the most needy countries and areas around the world. And for more on our discussion in New York, we have uh, Mr. Hao Liang Xu, who is Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and also Director of the Regional Bureau for Asia and Pacific United Nations Development Program in Kabul, in Afghanistan. Douglas Kay, who is a Country Director of UNDP in Afghanistan. Welcome to both of you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to start with Afghanistan. Mr. Kay, you have been together with your colleagues, try to build a bridge in Afghanistan and it seems to be widely reported. Uh, how much do you think these kind of infrastructure is likely to help with the local community? Well, um, a bridge is easy to, to imagine in all of our minds uh, what it looks like. But when you really think about the impact that it has on people's lives, um, allowing children to go to school, whereas many girls would not be allowed to walk the distances that would require them to walk all the way down the river and all the way back up, when it allows people to carry um, goods and services across the bridge, uh, cutting their um, commuting time and delivery times by, you know, by, by, by half or, you know, uh, it makes a huge impact on mm. what um, the choices that people have in their lives, the practical impact on making people's lives better through increasing the choices that they have. Um, that's what development is about. That's what UNDP stands for. And that's why we're so excited about um, the various infrastructure investments, the donors, yeah. and hopefully also with China uh, moving forward, we'll be able to uh, bring about. I see a lot of passion in your eyes, uh, Douglas, when you are talking about the changes going on on the ground with your work, uh, UNDP in Afghanistan. How Liang, what about for you? I mean, you as uh, the UNDP for Asia Pacific had uh, went to launch this, the Sustainable Development Goals in Afghanistan. You work also earlier in some of the Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan, you know, Iran, Pakistan. How much do you think this infrastructure thing, connectivity, is really likely to change the picture, or is too much exaggeration? No, I think uh, uh, infrastructure has been proven to be a key driver of economic growth and the prosperity. I think that there will be no exception when it comes to the bridge and the uh, road initiative. And uh, if we talk about bridges, Afghanistan sits uh, in the middle of uh, major countries in the region, right? And uh, uh, India, Pakistan, and uh, China. So it's a bridge to Central Asia and the further down to Middle East. And I think uh, uh, the fact that uh, last year 
uh, the freight train from chi China has arrived in Afghanistan, mm. and the flight between uh, Urumqi and uh, Kabul has uh, restarted. Are all indications that uh, this bridge road is going to expand, and with the expansion of this uh, connectivity, there will be more uh, growth and more jobs, more pr prosperity. I believe. Well said, Hao Liang. But where does the money come from? I mean, that's always the ultimate question, isn't it? You said in a speech at Columbia University uh, a few weeks ago that now the only ten, only one percent, in fact, of foreign aid coming from uh, GDP of uh, many developed economies. Earlier, it was ten percent. So money are getting ever smaller. So where would the money come from for all of these uh, connectivity building? Only from China? Is that going to work? Uh, it's a, a very important question. Where will the money come from? Uh, according to Asian Development Bank, the infrastructure investment needs uh, for Asia Pacific uh, every year is 1.5 to, to 1.7 trillion dollars. So it is clear that uh, money from uh, the multi-development banks and the money from from the public sector is not going to be enough. That's why uh, the partnership is going to be important. I think that's at the essence of this Belt and Road Initiative. That is to encourage partnerships on a voluntary basis between China and the participating countries and all you know, other multilateral institutions, such as ADB and also the AIIB. And uh, uh, I think the key is to uh, find uh, projects that will bring benefits, mm -hmm. tangible benefits to the people as soon as possible, not only in major urban centers, but also to population live in uh, rural areas. The such as in Afghanistan. But Douglas, some would say, partnership really on what kind of projects? I mean, in Afghanistan, you have a lot of resources. The locals have a lot of resources on extractive industries. But some would say, we don't need partnership about this because others are going to get our resources away rather than uh, letting us uh, enjoy the benefits of our resources. What would you say, Douglas? Well, um, I think UNDP in Afghanistan holds a special position among all the UN agencies and all the providers of, of aid to this country. We are the largest provider um, where donors, uh, uh, more than any other agency, has provided us with the financing to uh, add on our technical assistance, our experiences from other parts of the world, the best practices that we have identified, and how we can bring to bear those lessons here in Afghanistan. And I think what donors and, and the partnership um, with UNDP ultimately stems from um, our, experience in, in our experience in managing funds. Um, we, are, we are operating in a highly insecure, high-risk environment where, as you mentioned, you mentioned the extractive industry. Um, well, you know, the, they're, they're, they believe that there's more than $1.3 trillion of minerals under the ground here in Afghanistan, mm. which will provide a, a huge amount of long-term development support for the country. However, um, developing the systems to manage the, 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 the industry, the funds, um, ensuring that the revenues and the profits are, 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 are spread and so that you have an inclusive growth process which includes people throughout the country and yeah. the, the, the wealth is not concentrated in the hands of a few. Um, there aren't many agencies that can manage that, that have the experience in supporting governments to develop these systems. And I think as we move forward, um, you know, the, the security situation is the, the most, the foremost um, uh, a risk to development at this point. However, um, with the Brussels conference, there was a big development conference um, about uh, right. in September of last year where donors throughout the world set the agenda for the next four years. And clearly, um, the focus now is long-term capacity building. How can we support well, the country, the government, as well as the private sector to develop the systems to manage these high potential growth long, industries? Long-term capacity building, that's the key word. And also, you use the key word, Hao Liang, about partnership. But the question is, mm. is BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, really the most favorable platform likely to be used. Uh, are there other platforms that is better or at this point it seems more promising? Yeah, no, thank you. I think uh, on this uh, question of uh, 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 extractive industry, I think the key here is uh, to have a transparency right, in the government you know, uh, system. Mm. And uh, in this uh, regard, I think progress is being made for public services. 
and also uh, you need uh, infrastructure, you need uh, power, you know, uh, sta uh, uh, stations to generate the power for industry. So there are also progress in this regard. On the peace front, the government has signed an agreement with one of the uh, uh, groups that are fighting the government. So progress is being made, but a lot more progress is needed. Right? So in terms of uh, platforms, the Bridge and the Road Initiative is uh, a platform to uh, encourage a multilateral cooperation, right, to uh, through connectivity, through uh, investment flows, through people-to-people -people exchange, to again provide the opportunities for growth and for prosper prosperity. Now, uh, uh, another international uh, framework that is accepted accepted by all countries in the world mm. is this Sustainable Development Agenda for 2030. That's right. Uh, the framework of Sustainable Development Goals. I think uh, what we need to do now is to try to create synergies to align the objectives, the vision, the visions of the uh, pr uh, uh, bridge and the road initiative with the visions of the sustainable development goals so that the, what is seen as a Chinese initiative is actually in line with uh, what is widely accepted uh, as an international cooperation framework for mm -hmm. development. That's an interesting point that you just made, the Haoliang, because uh, even though it started from China, the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, it has become ever more inclusive to have more players, not only international organizations like the United Nations Development Program, but also private sectors and others. Uh, but the th thing is how will that be done on time, efficiently, in order to make sure connectivity is going to happen as soon as possible? Right. I think. Uh a lot has happened. I think that's uh, the reality. In, term, in terms of agreements, I understand that more than 50 uh, MOUs have been signed between China and uh, other uh, uh, governments. You know. And also in terms of connectivity, I mentioned the flight uh, between uh, China and uh, uh, Afghanistan. But we know that uh, just uh, two, weeks, two weeks ago, or about a week ago, we read the news that a freight train from London was dispatched uh, to China. Mm. Right? And when I was uh, in uh, Poland last year, uh, attending a meeting on Belt and Road Initiative, uh, a train from China has just arrived in Warsaw. So uh, a lot of uh, connectivities are already taking place. I think, uh, and also uh, from what I understand, uh, what I read, uh, in 2016, $18.5 billion has been invested by Chinese uh, uh, enterprises and the government you know, uh, in countries along the Belt and Road, you know, uh, participating countries. Mm. And I understand also uh, 160,000 uh, local jobs have been established as a result of this investment. So I think things are happening. What's important is that uh, all participating countries right, are working together to strive for mutual benefits, right, to look at uh, sustainability, sustainable mm. development. We want to learn lessons from the past so that uh, the future growth stimulated by all development initiatives, including Belt and Road, is sustainable and inclusive. Right? I think that's a key word, sustainability and inclusivity. That all sounds great, but Douglas, for example, in the country of Af Afghanistan, even coming to our program at late of night is kind of dangerous, and thank you for doing that for us. But the question is how to guarantee security transparency and also stability in a country such as Afghanistan where you are for the UNDP in order to make sure all of this is going to happen and money going to be spent well and smartly? Well, um, how the money is spent well and smartly really is the key in, in terms of our cooperation with China right now. Um, I had a meeting with the Chinese ambassador here uh, in Kabul and the embassy uh, with my program team a couple of weeks ago and it's clear that um, even though China has primarily uh, provided aid to Afghanistan through bilateral channels direct from China to Afghanistan in the past, um, the government, the Chinese government is currently seriously considering how to broaden its approach to include the multilateral channel more here in Afghanistan for one reason because they want to benefit from the United Nations experience in managing funds in such a highly insecure, high-risk environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, we've had programs and operations throughout the whole country for many, many years. And um, that experience in terms of how to account for each dollar, yen, euro, each m unit of financing here is, is no small challenge. 
And again, um, it, it's going to be interesting with the Belt and Road Initiative to see how we can catalyze China's support, financial, right. and good intentions to practical impact on the ground. And that's our discussions right now with, with the Chinese government. You mentioned a very interesting point, which is, you know, UNDP used to be this donor organization in a way. You provide funding for countries in which you are working for. But now you have turned, Haoliang, if I remember right, you were talking about as the head of the Asia Pacific for UNDP, that you have become a service provider. So with this role change, how will be your role, I mean UNDP's role, working on this BRI platform or cooperating with BRI platform becoming extremely dramatic, I would say? Yep, no, I think it's a great question, very important. Uh, UNDP used to be the channel of resources uh, for development in developing countries, but that uh, was uh, 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 the decades ago. And uh, over the last uh, 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 few decades, and the, the importance, the growth of Asia has increased. In the 1950s, Asia's uh, output right, in world GDP is about 10%. Today, it's 40%. Okay. And this is going to increase further. So this means that the domestic resources that our governments command for their development has in increased uh, tremendously and dwarfs the international uh, ODA uh, that is still important, catalytic. Right? But the point is that our role has to change. We're, we're no longer the source of financing, but with our experience, accumulated experience, our impartiality, we can provide a lot of value added to our governments. That's why we're working with our government as a service provider to find the innovative and the practical solutions to the development challenges, such as climate change, such as natural disaster risk reduction, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, uh, urbanization, aging, and many new issues. I think in the Belt and Road Initiative, through the signing of the MOU we, uh, with the government, we're going to work with uh, the Chinese government on research and knowledge mm. about Belt and Road about uh, policy uh, coordination, right? about uh, doing pilot projects right, in Belt and Road countries, particularly to ensure that the Belt and Road initiatives are in compliance with the social and the environmental standards so that they support sustainability and inclusivi inclusivity yeah. of uh, our common objective. But you know, Hao Liang, you have got a lot of competitions because a lot of international organizations, even under the UN umbrella, want to work with China on some of the points you just mentioned. For example, the World Bank and also some of the other organizations. How are you going to compete with them? This is an interesting question because ever more you see the project get inclusive, more players coming in. UNDP, are you really going to get the key position? I think, uh, again, you know, I think the challenge here is that. Uh, we work uh, with uh, the Chinese government and all our participating uh, country governments. You know, uh, I think it's important to uh, recognize that we are present in most of the uh, Belt and Road countries in the developing world. So we can really play a role to mm. enhance uh, co uh, policy coordination and the coherence of you know, uh, multiple development initiatives. We can work to ensure that the Belt and Road initiatives are part of uh, the t national development planning that uh, actually support national development objectives. Yeah. So we can uh, work with our partners together, not in a way to compete, but uh, uh, in a way that's really coherent for uh, national development objectives. Douglas, you know, you work in Afghanistan for UNDP, but some say this is going to be a very exceptional case. Others say this is going to be a crystallization of how countries in danger and under security uh, threat n could work on a global basis to develop its future, for example, on BRI. What would you say? Do you think this experience can be duplicated in different ways for other parts of the world? Well, I think what's clear is um, Afghanistan is one of the poorest countries in Asia at this point in time. Um, and therefore, in China's support to this country 
in many respects can have a much more catalytic uh, uh, multiplier effect than it might have in other countries. Um, the, the openness of Afghanistan to support from China, and not only financing, but also the technical experience and the lessons learned from China, for example, in the area of infrastructure, can have a much deeper and, and, and uh, more profound impact here in these environments. Now also, um, China's been involved not only on the economic and development side, but also on the political side. And over the past year, um, China has increasingly become uh, involved in some of the uh, high-level peace negotiations that have taken place. Now those negotiations have, have taken a bit of a pause at this point for various other political reasons, but it's clear that China also sees the need and the importance of getting involved to ensure that sooner than later peace is achieved here in Afghanistan. Because without peace, there can be no uh, significant uh, private sector-led mm. growth in this country. Without private sector-led growth, it's harder for the government of Afghanistan to collect the tax revenues to support itself in the future. At the end of the day, what we all want, China, UNDP, the government of Afghanistan, is for a government in Afghanistan to govern independently to move away from this 15 years of extraordinary dependence that's been developed in this country mm -hmm. so that we have a country and a government that can govern itself in peace, towards peace and prosperity. I see a lot of determination in that answer, Douglas. Uh, Hao Liang, though, as a member of the UNDP umbrella, you have to keep neutrality in a way. And you work with China, if UNDP, on the BRI issue. Does that make UNDP stand in line uh, uh, in the one country against the other countries? I mean, people would also say, you yourself originally coming from China. Are you swaying to one side or the other side? Yeah, I've been uh, actually asked uh, this question many times. <laughs> uh, my I'll, answer, I'll let you uh, to answer it once again. That, yes. <laughs> Go ahead. No, definitely. I think my answer is very, very simple. You know, I think uh, with or without the NDP, China is uh, pushing ahead with uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, the fact that more than 50 countries have uh, signed a cooperation agreement with China is an indication uh, in itself, right, the value of this initiative. I think uh, what the Belt and Road Initiative is, uh, uh, is that uh, it, it is a vision, right? Mm. A, a vision for long-term collaboration right, through connectivity, right, through uh, movement of uh, 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 you know uh, people, right, and the exchange you know of people yes. through increasing investment opportunities to drive for mutual uh, prosperity. That's I think what it is. Okay. Now in this effort, right, UNDP can add value. As I said earlier, we can work with the Chinese partners and. The other you know, participating countries, particularly in the developing world, to ensure that the projects of this Belt and Road Initiative yeah. are, are actually taken into consideration of lessons learned, right, of, of past development, and also, really importantly, uh, the social and the environmental standards that support, you know, uh, 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 inclusivity, so that the whole society is benefiting, okay. not just the major city centers, right, where investments. Ah, you know, in terms of connectivity, I think we can really add value, right, to to ensure that the development is actually, you know, uh, welcomed by all, not mm. just a few. Hao Liang Xu, Douglas K, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Certainly, this is an interesting case study of how an international organization is working with the platform of BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Really appreciate. It. Thank you for joining us. You're watching World Insight on CGTN, still to come on our program. I speak to the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Novelette, Hao Jingfang. We discuss her sci-fi short story, Folding Beijing. Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN and Tianwei. In an unspecified future, Beijing within the Sixth Ring Road is physically divided into three classes, sharing the same Earth surface in each 48-hour cycle. This is a sighting of a Chinese science fiction novel 
Folding Beijing. The book's author, Hao Jingfang, was endowed with a special honor, becoming the first Chinese woman to win a Hugo Award for Best Novelette for the year 2016. Earlier in Beijing, I sat down with her, who told me that what inspired her to talk about such a bizarre world. Before the interview, let's take a look at this. Folding Beijing, the best novelette at the 74th World Science Fiction Convention, tells of the struggle of a father trying to send his daughter to school in futuristic Beijing, an allusion to the difficulties that some current Chinese parents undergo to ensure their children receive a high-quality education. Author of the book, Hao Jingfang, said in the acceptance speech that while the book gives dark solutions to real-life problems, she hopes the real future will be brighter than her story. Established in 1953, the Hugo Awards acknowledge the best works of science fiction or fantasy and are seen as the highest honor bestowed in science fiction and fantasy writing. Hao was very calm and controlled upon receiving the award, but is now even more passionate about writing than ever. I feel normal. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I do everything for fun. Your novel, Folding Beijing, made me wonder. It is more a science fiction, or it is more a social critique novel itself. It is a science fiction novel because if there is no changes in the technological parts, there will be no、uh, structure of this stru、uh, story. But、uh, on the other hand, I do have those、um, original ideas from everyday life. I did. Uh, see those pictures in Beijing in my life. I used to work in、uh, in some economic study offices that based in the、uh, Guomao area, which is the richest、uh, place in, in business yeah、district. central business district. And, and then I I really saw those、uh, decision makers, the policy makers, and those、uh, CEOs of、uh, the companies. Then after work, I see some other、uh, migrant workers、uh, around my home. They really had those、um, uh, difficult lives. I feel that uh, uh, in somebody's life in this city, they just、uh, don't feel、uh, there are some other people in this city. Then this kind of、uh, um, separation had the strong、uh, impression in my heart, and then I just. To try to express this impressive,、mm. and you choose science fiction, yeah, this genre to、mm. express what you have just saw、mm. and thought about.、Mm. Why? Because science fiction、uh, do give you the、um, ability to change the world. Science fiction is the genre about possibilities. You can just um, uh, manipulate this world and. Uh, give、uh, new settings to the world, and then you can create your story. But in the、um, pure literature genre, you have to be honest、uh, to the outside world. You have to keep the world、uh, as it is. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? I'm quite uh, uh, op optimistic in human. I do think that、uh, human are getting. Better and better, we can、uh, know each other better. We can understand, respect to each other. But、um, on the other hand, I feel that、uh, there are some natural laws、uh, that exist in the human society. That、uh, a perfect society will not be、uh, eternal. Per perfect society will not be true.、Uh, we still have to fight with、um, uh, some common fate. So I. On this sense, I'm not very optimistic. Talking about folding Beijing,、um, was it because you are optimistic about seeking solutions to the problem of social divide you just talked about that you use the genre of science fiction, or actually, it is such a difficult issue to be resolved that you have to seek the help of a science fiction in order to. Point out the issue, and yet at the same time, do not have to face it yourself. I really don't think the solutions in Folding Beijing is a good solution. It's a quite dark one,、uh, and I don't, I don't hope it to be true in the future. I I think that、um, 
uh, if in a most uh, optimistic view, uh, we what we can do is we try to educate those low skill workers, those low income people, and try to um, transfer them into the next era and try to help them to just uh, get involved into the new businesses. That's the optimistic view and the solutions for this problem. The Hugo Award was given to the first Chinese writer in 2015. Liu Chexin wrote the science fiction novel The Three-Body Problem that was met with rave reviews. The book discusses human responses to alien invasions and other issues common to all of humanity. It has sold more than a million copies in China and will hit the big screen soon. Developing sci-fi movies is the trend now. That is highly likely to drive the public's interest back toward sci-fi literature. Chinese science fiction should adapt to this trend in the new media era. However, China's science fiction market is still in its infancy. There are only about 200 Chinese science fiction novelists, and the number of those highly regarded in the genre are fewer than 30, far behind countries like the U.S. and Japan. How is the level of sci-fi related to the creativity of the country or the capability of writers to combine realities and aspirations? Hao Jingfang has her own answers. After Liu Cixin winning the award, you also got the Hugo Award. Many wonder, where is the real level of Chinese science fiction? Are we really there? Actually, I think that the Chinese writers are already very creative uh, ever since uh, 20 years ago. I, we have uh, a circle of uh, the sci-fi writers in China, and I always feel the creativity and encouragement from all the other authors. And uh, I myself uh, got a lot of inspirational ideas from the others. I, I do have the confidence in Chinese science fiction writers. I think that uh, it's just uh, perhaps time for the world to know China. But people would compare, let's just say, Stephen King, George Marlin. Their works, you see their works in every airport around the world. And they write, of course, in English, which is easier to spread around. But where is the future of Chinese sci-fi writers? I mean, internationally speaking, just be frank. Um, I think that uh, the Chinese, the young, younger generation writers uh, should have uh, more uh, time to just uh, devote themselves into long, some longer works because uh, that needs a lot of uh, energies and a lot of time um, f to, for you to create uh, such a huge world. Uh, but c perhaps the younger re uh, writers in China now um, just enjoy some uh, interesting small pieces. Uh, um, only only a small number of writers uh, uh, wrote the longer novels. I, I, I do hope that uh, uh, these young writers would create uh, such a huge world in the future. Uh, but why would they do that? I mean, they could do small work and they could used to be famous. And uh, people want to uh, have a fast track to reputation, success, do you think they will be able to be like you, to really sit down there every day, two to three hours, consistent, no matter what it means? Actually, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the reason for one writer to finish such a huge work is the passion. You. You, you, you sh should have the passion in writing itself. You have the, all those imagined worlds in your head. You just want to make the imagination come down to the paper. And this kind of uh, creation uh, process is so interesting that a writer can devote it uh, into it for years and years and years. I believe that uh, George Martin and J.K. Rowling, all these kind of writers do have that passion in him or her. Um, I, I, I think I hope that uh, um, there will be writers in China who have that kind of passion in him or her. You are passionate enough. Yeah, I'm passionate. Uh, You're very passionate because last time when I met you, we were talking at a big scale conference among all the crowds, you know. And then after Wrapping up the morning session, you told me you have to go back to your hotel. Later in the afternoon, I saw you again because you need to be there and make some remarks. 
and you told me you spent two hours in the hotel room trying to write something. What did you write that day? Uh, actually, uh, in that conference, I wrote the beginning of the Han Dynasty story. Wow. Yeah, uh, so it, it's uh, very interesting for me because I was in an economic conference in the morning. I was in the Han Dynasty in the afternoon, and I came back to the economic forum <laughs> at that time. But uh, I enjoy this kind of uh, transferring from one world to another to another. But that takes a lot of effort. I mean. When you write, you have to really get yourself there. This kind of switch will be challenging for anyone, writers included. But I, I always feel that I'm always there. I'm always in the other world, in the uh, writing world. I just uh, sometimes come back to real life uh, for a short <laughs> period of time, and then I come back again. Really? Yeah. <laughs> How is that happening? I, I just uh, feel that everything is a parallel universe. I just transfer from this universe to another one, to another one, whenever it's a literature world or a, a family world or economic world. When I enter this world, I just uh, obey the rules in this world. Another, I just uh, use another language. But I am s s quite used to this kind of experiences. But because I think that all writers uh, um, in, in some t time in his or her life, uh, have these kind of experiences of uh, entering another world and another world and another world. Uh, it's technology happening so fast. How much do you think you know new things such as AI, such as virtual reality, all of these might be able to transform or challenge your works? Science fiction works are about possibilities. Um, they discuss the how human would react in different kind of situations, well, how people would feel in this kind of situation, how people will uh, react to, uh, with each other in other situations. So it is these kind of uh, mental experiments that really interests me and other readers. What are you mentally exper experimenting? Now I'm most interested in the artificial intelligence. I think a lot about uh, what's the differences between uh, AIs and humans. What are the differences uh, of uh, their uh, mental processes and what is really, what does intelligence mean and uh, how um, and will the uh, AI become super intelligence in the future and what would that be like and how should AIs and uh, humans uh, interact with each other. Talking about creativity, where does that come from? Actually I found out that uh, creativity just uh, came in your life. If you're honest enough to the feelings of your life, to the everyday thoughts in your head, you do have that creativity in you. Uh, creativity is inside everybody's uh, body and heart because we do have a lot of thoughts every day when you read a book, when you meet someone, right. when you study, when you talk to someone, you have a lot of uh, thoughts in your but head. How grab it? Yeah, the, it's uh, in a turmoil. But if you do have the habit of uh, um, reflect yourself and uh, just uh, look inside your head and uh, question yourself. Yeah. How do you do that to be able to examine yourself and let your creativity blossom? But uh, I spent 10 years uh, just uh, questioning myself. So at last I found that these kind of experiences become the treasure in me. I had that habit of, oh, at this time, what's the reason for it? Is there something wrong? Oh, I know, that has the reason. And then I, I feel the thoughts and the feelings in me, and then I try to uh, use these thoughts and uh, feelings sci-fi writer Hao Jinfang. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of our program, you can search for us, World Insights CGTN, in your search engine, or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on World Insight team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night.